welcome to Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. I'm Pragya. Dramatic developments in Peru as President Pedro Castillo has been overthrown in what many are calling a constitutional coup. We discussed developments so far and look ahead on our show today. On the same continent, Argentina's current Vice President and former President Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, a popular leader, has been sentenced to six years on corruption charges. This is a culmination of a long campaign of lawfare against her. And finally, in some positive news, there has been some progress in the pandemic treaty discussions. World Health Organization members will discuss a draft of an accord in February that might make the next health crisis on a global scale less painful. Wednesday was a dramatic day in Peru with the besieged leftist president Pedro Castillo being overthrown by parliament. The right-wing parliament has been on the offensive ever since Castillo took power trying every trick in the book to impeach him. On Wednesday, Castillo announced that he was dissolving Congress, following which the legislature impeached him and Vice President Dina Boluarte was sworn in as the new president. Zoe from People's Dispatch has been tracking this development and we spoke to her just a short while ago. Hey Zoe, thanks for joining us. So Zoe, can you first bring us up to speed on the developments so far which have led Castillo to uh, leave his office? What's, what's going on? Well, it's been a crazy 24 hours, to be honest. A lot of uh, updates coming out. Um, but essentially, uh, Pedro Castillo was removed by the Congress in what some are calling a legislative coup against him uh, through an impeachment motion. He was taken out of office. This decision was taken very quickly after um, the, he had ruled to dissolve the Congress. And... Uh, why did he do this? He did this because he was facing the third impeachment motion against him. And so he knew that the Congress had already gained enough power uh, to get this vote, to vote him out of office with this impeachment move, uh, motion. So he attempted to dissolve the Congress, um, but this did not prove uh, successful. He did not get the backing of the armed forces and the other bodies of power that would, he would have needed um, to actually protect himself with this move. And instead, it further uh, angered and maybe even brought more support to the impeachment motion, and he was taken out of office. Um, and it's really important to say here that this is a legislative coup. This has been brewing since he took office. Um, Pedro Castillo has been backed into a corner with essentially no other options, and that's why we see him take this move yesterday to dissolve the Congress. Um, but really, he's been facing a firing squad since he's he's been sworn in. Um, he hasn't been able to maintain a cabinet. There's been pressure from the media, um, from the Congress, from the judiciary, a very classic lawfare campaign against him. He hasn't been able to really fulfill a lot of his campaign promises, even because of this, because he's been facing so much pressure by all the different right wing forces in society. And so that's really the situation we see today is that he's removed with the legislative coup. He had attempted to take some measure to protect himself amid an impending impeachment motion, but this was unsuccessful. All of the right-wing forces uh, united against him, even the OAS, the Organization of American States, who he had previously turned to for support and protection from this impending impeachment, also turned against him, supported the measure to remove him, and it's extremely, extremely um, concerning. So it hasn't been very long for him in office, uh, a year and a half or so. So why such strident attacks? Why the lawfare? And also what have been some of the responses that uh, that have come from uh, to the developments. Well, yeah, as you said, it's really it's oh, it's been less than a year and a half since he's been sworn in, and it's important to remember that in the moment that Pedro Castillo wins the elections, it really comes as a surprise for the right wing. It is a complete surprise that a peasant, a teacher who's from the teachers' union, is able to swoop in and win these elections. Um, if we can remember that in the first round of the presidential elections in Peru in um, April two thousand twenty one. He wasn't even a favored candidate. Uh, the Essentially, the polls showed that it was a complete split between uh, several different candidates from across the political spectrum, from right to center to left. Um, and Pedro Castillo wasn't even figured in as a possibility. However, he came in, he actually won the first round of these elections. 
him and Keiko Fujimori, who's the daughter of former dictator Alberto Fujimori, moved on to the second round. And from there, really, there began a very, very fierce campaign against him. They knew that if a teacher from a union who was really with the peasant people of Peru came to office with his plans to rewrite the constitution, to create a better life for all, uh, his slogan was, no poor people in a rich country, and that if his dream came to fruition, then it would be over for the ruling class. And so from there, they, they began a very intense strategy, of course, to first win the elections, which were extremely polarized, given the fact that Keiko Fujimori is the daughter of a former dictator. So it was actually quite difficult for them to galvanize the full support of the bourgeoisie, of the middle class, who also kind of have a sort of dislike and distrust of Fujimorism because it is such a far right um, strand and, and position in society. And so in these elections, Pedro Castillo won with a very slim margin. And it was this election result was in dispute for at least a month. Um, in the courts, disputing every single vote again um, that he received, um, saying that they were fraudulent. But finally, after one month, they finally accepted, uh, the far right accepted its defeat. Pedro Castillo, his victory was proclaimed just days before he was supposed to be sworn in on July 28th. Um, and then, so really when he's sworn in, we have to understand that it's already in a situation of destabilization. The right-wing forces are already working to undermine him, um, to attack him in the media, in the judiciary. And that situation hasn't stopped until now. And so today what we're seeing is the accumulation of this process that has been going on for 16 months against Pedro Castillo, against his party, against um, his project for the country. And we also have to remember he was forced to reshuffle his cabinet four times. Many members of his party had take, uh, faced attacks, uh, investigations by the prosecution's office of corruption and other outlandish crimes, which they really had no evidence for. Um, but this is this is kind of the situation that helps us understand. And this development has received a lot of different reactions. I think a lot of people were shocked and confused with what was happening. Difficult to understand, especially given the fact that he attempted to dissolve the Congress. For many, this was seen as an undemocratic move. Others understood it in the face of this impeachment. Um, but now I think we can say that 12 hours after the fact, more than 12 hours after the fact, a lot of people are realizing the gravity of this and realizing that it is important to defend Pedro Castillo. And this is just another right-wing coup against um, progressive forces in Latin America and specifically Peru. Right, Zoe, thanks a lot for joining us with that update. And uh, just uh, stay with us for another couple of minutes. We'll be back with you. A three-judge panel in Argentina has held Vice President Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, the country's president for two terms between 2007 and 2015, guilty of fraudulent administration. The judges have said she diverted around one billion U.S. dollars in government funds during her presidency. They rejected the charge that she ran a criminal organization. Christina is popular across Latin America and recently faced an assassination attempt. Is it an orchestrated campaign against her? What's the next step for her? We return to Zoe from People's Dispatch. Okay, so Zoe, thanks for staying with us. Uh, Zoe, what is the case against De Kirchner? What is going on there? On Tuesday, December 6th, um, a court in Argentina sentenced Vice President Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner to six years in prison and disqualified her from holding any uh, public office. Uh, these were on corruption and fraud charges. Um, but again, similar to what we saw with Pedro Castillo, this is the result of a very long campaign against uh, Cristina, against Peronism um, by the right wing in the country. Um, and it's interesting, I think the most important point of her sentence is the fact that she's banned from holding public office. Um, this is specifically because Cristina is seen as the most viable candidate for the 2023 elections um, for progressive forces. She's really um, the figure that is able to unite all progressive forces in Argentina throughout these years of crisis in Argentina, of extreme economic despair, of a lot of difficulties for um, working class sectors in the country. She's really been the figure that's been able to um, inspire hope and give uh, people a, a sense that there's a possibility for change. So with this ruling, it's extremely, extremely concerning. And we have to remember that it comes 
uh, over a month after the assassination attempt against her That's right. um, by that was coordinated by right wing forces. There's a lot of different investigations going on about what uh, different groups were linked to this assassination attempt. However, someone did attempt to end her life, and that has to be um, re remembered that this is all part of the same plot to really take her out of political life, to take the vision that she represents out of political life, and to kind of uh, impose this right-wing um, perspective for society. And really, the case against her uh, is one another case of lawfare. Um, there's a, a lot of, it has to do with corruption and her involvement in different um and different corruption schemes that they've uh, brought to, to the fore in these in these hearings. But it's important to point out that, again, uh, for example, the judge and the prosecution all have links to right wing groups in the country. And so there's actually been a lot of different exposés about this kind of network behind these accusations against her. Um, it is has clear political motivations um, and that has to be always under uh, reminded. Yeah, Zoe, so, you know, she's actually a towering figure uh, even beyond Argentina, a sort of figure for Latin America. So what have been some of the responses that we've been getting and also what happens next? Well, again, she uh, her sentencing and her conviction was uh, met with a lot of uh, rejection, massive street mobilizations in support of her. The hashtag All of Us with Christina also went across social media. Um, but... Also, uh, progressive leaders across Latin America, President, Bolivian President Luis Arce, the Argentine president himself, Alberto Fernandez, who he himself uh, with Cristina has had some conflict during this time, their time in office. They've been at odds. This has been a, a primary point of discussion, political discussion, is kind of the distancing between these two sectors of the government, between the president and uh, the vice president. But he also condemned the the verdict, um, as well as other figures such as Cuban president, um, Miguel, Miguel Diaz-Canel, and people across the, the, the continent. And I think it's very important uh, to remember that this process of lawfare, of involving political officials, progressive political officials in these uh, scandals, which have to do with a collusion between right-wing members of the media, of the judiciary, um, is happening across the continent and it's not isolated in Argentina. We saw this in Ecuador. We saw this in Brazil with Lula. He ended up, uh, the 22 kind of convictions against him were all overturned right. because it was proved that they had political motivation. So it's really important to understand this context um, in which this is happening. Right, Zoe, and thanks a lot for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. How can the world come together to put their experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic to good use? That's one of the things discussed recently at the Intergovernmental Negotiating Body or INB of the WHO. The INB has met several times to get countries to agree on ways to prepare for any future pandemics. Disagreements on sharing intellectual property rights were a big dampener on the global response to COVID-19. Not everybody could access drugs and devices against the illness, but the United States still won't waive these rights to fight COVID-19. Jyotsna from the People's Health Movement joins us with an update on what's going on there. So Jyotsna, thanks for joining us. The pandemic treaty is a very important discussion that's going on. Can you just tell us how far the discussion has got? Also, I was reading something about countries having the option to opt in or you know whether it will be binding or not. Can you just explain what the details here are? Uh, thanks for inviting me again. Uh, so the thing is that actually in Geneva, two important meetings have happened this week. Uh, one at the level of World Trade Organization, which was on 6th December, and the other uh, 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 at the World Health Organization, which was from 5th to 7th uh, of December. So I'll first uh, begin with the uh, what happened at WTO. Uh, so just a little recap. So India and South Africa, the governments had submitted a proposal in October 2020, that is just a few months after the COVID-19 pandemic began, asking for waiving of all types of intellectual property for all types of 
COVID-19 medical products, be it medicines, vaccines, ventilator, ventilator valves, masks, everything of that sort, right? Um, but, uh, and very soon, uh, they garnered a lot of support from uh, developing countries. Uh, uh, more than 100 countries within a couple of months started to support the proposal at the WTO. But uh, the developed countries, the rich nations, led by US, Australia, uh, Euro uh, European Union, especially Switzerland, all of these countries, they ensured that that proposal did not come through. And what we got in June this year, that was after one and a half years of intense negotiations and the kind of devastation that the world went through, after all of that, what we got was an extremely compromised text, uh, which was uh, very limiting and applicable only to the vaccines. So uh, it uh, and uh, so it was in that background that we had the meeting. There was one more. Uh, there was one clause in the June twenty two decision. Uh, we are calling it TRIPS decision, uh, which said that the countries will revisit that decision uh, uh, within six months and decide. Uh, whether they want to extend it to therapeutics and diagnostics also or not. It was only for the vaccines. Okay. Um, uh, so this is what had to be decided. And uh, what we saw was a complete face-off between the Global North and the Global South. Uh, again, led by the US, uh, this extension uh, uh, has not uh, looks like has not been approved. It was a closed-door meeting, so we do not know for sure what happened. But we know that the kind of pressures that US created the U.S. Trade Representative um, released uh, a press release and a statement saying that the U.S. will ask for, uh, uh, will not let the extension to therapeutics and diagnostics happen in this meeting, which is really sad because um, uh, a lot of people fought for it. A lot of developing country governments fought for it. Um, and But the uh, another interesting part is, and that's where the struggle part comes, that uh, um, many developing countries actually came together, including India, Brazil, Bangladesh, Argentina, uh, Bolivia, Venezuela, and uh, they submitted to the WTO uh, uh, that uh, they are not happy with what happened in June. It is a very strong language that they have used that they're not happy and they want the extension to happen right away. Um, so this is what happened. But uh, um, if you look at some of the reports that have come out, um, it looks like that the developed countries are uh, uh, and led, of course, uh, pushed by their uh, pharma companies. Uh, they are very sure that they are uh, not letting this uh, extension happen immediately. So a lot of fight still remains. And let us not forget that COVID is not over. Uh, right. even though it has gone off the reporting. Let us not forget that Africa still has very low vaccination rates and the people will need therapeutics and diagnostics. They, they still need them to survive. So we are in a situation where we need uh, these uh, medicines, affordable uh, and effective medicines and tests right now. It right, Jyotsna, this, the Right, Jyotsna, there's a discussion also about coming up in February with a draft through the WHO platform. What's that about? Yeah, uh, exactly. So this is the second meeting that happened around the same time, again in Geneva. Uh, so uh, the WHO uh, is right now discussing a pandemic accord, uh, which is for the future pandemics. And the idea was that the kind of learnings and experiences we have had during COVID-19 and it is sort of an acceptance that we did not respond the way we should have responded as a global community. Um, so that is uh, being discussed that what should we do um, uh, the, for future pandemics. Um, and the good part was that, so this was a third meeting of all the governments, non-state actors uh, were also allowed to make statements. The good part was that it was live streamed. So a lot of people could uh, uh, hear and understand what was happening, unlike the WTO meeting, which was completely closed doors. And these are, that's the problem with WTO all the time. Um, so WHO, this happened. And uh, uh, again, there was a face off between the developed and the developing countries. Um, the uh, uh, led by US again, the developed countries are saying that the, uh, they, they are not in favor of patents. Uh, Brazil, for example, pointed out uh, very nicely that why all the intellectual property discussion is 
in the brackets why we are uh, not making it something that should come up front and um, why are not making uh, uh, why are not we having it come up front because ultimately it is the intellectual property barriers which emerged as the biggest barrier in accessing COVID-19 medical products. Um, so developing countries there also and many other countries, they uh, told WHO and the governments that we want um, uh, to include intellectual property. So what has come out of it is that uh, the good part is uh, there is an understanding that by early 2023, that is by February 2023, the, the first draft should be ready and uh, the co-chairs are uh, from Netherlands and South Africa. So because South Africa generally has taken a position uh, against uh, intellectual property um, and they were the co-sponsors for the WTO proposal. So we are hope so that is some good part. So we are hoping that uh, we will have some language. Uh, but looking at what is happening at WTO, this is going to be a fight. I mean, if in the middle of the pandemic, we could not waive uh, intellectual property, uh, then it will be a huge uphill task that uh, we have to prepare ourselves for. Activists, journalists, uh, governments from the global south will have to prepare themselves um, to see to it right. that we have a strong language against intellectual property in the WHO pandemic contract. Right, Jyotsna. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you. And thank you. That's a wrap for today. Thank you for watching Daily Debrief. We look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. And you will find more such stories on our website, peoplesdispatch.org. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.